Hello everybody, I am Mr. Aditya Jyoti Boshak, Senior Research Fellow, working under the supervision of Professor Dibbendu Shamanto and Professor Shomode at the School of Bioscience, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur. I am one of the designated teaching assistants who will be guiding you through this online NPTEL experimental biochemistry course. See you often. So before we move on to new experiments and learn new techniques, what I would like to do is, I would like to show you some of the common instruments that are available in any well set up molecular biology and biochemistry laboratory. So first of all, I would like to show you this instrument here. So this instrument is a laminar airflow, air, airflow cabinet and you will be looking at this instrument later on in further detail in the subsequent lectures, but in general what this uh, instrument is used for is basically once you open this and it is switched on, there is an airflow filter and it maintains an airflow positive pressure which prevents outside air from entering this enclosed area and this enclosed area is sterile. So, there are UV lamps which sterilize the inner region when not in use and also we keep spirit lamps and burners where we light them and we heat sterilize and alcohol sterilize this entire uh, region. So, this cabinet is mainly useful when you are working with bacterial cultures and you want to grow your bacteria, but you want to make sure that no other bacteria is growing apart from the bacteria of your interest. So, to maintain sterile environment, we use this laminar airflow cabinet. So, the machine that I have in front of me now is a temperature controlled shaker incubator and the purpose of this is that it allows us to grow bacteria in a controlled temperature environment. As you can see inside, there are different flasks containing volumes of bacterial growth media in which bacteria have been inoculated and as time progresses, they will grow in a temperature controlled environment. So, for now it has been set at 37 degree centigrade and the shaking is essential because it prevents the bacteria from settling down which is detrimental to bacterial growth and even more importantly it ensures proper aeration of the culture so that the bacteria can survive. So, some of the salient features are for now the bacteria that we are growing today is at 37 degree, but in many instances scientists need to grow bacteria at a lower temperature in case the protein that we need to express is toxic or in case the protein that is being expressed is not properly soluble. For such instances, bacteria needs to be grown at maybe 16 degree or 25 degree and those temperatures can also be set and maintained by this shaker incubator and also the RPM. For now, it is revolving at 200 revolutions per minute but that can also be lowered or increased as per requirement. So, you will be learning in detail about these uh, experiments in the subsequent lectures. So, for now what I did was just gave you a flavor of the instruments that are necessary for carrying out work in molecular biology and biochemistry. So, for certain experiments, it is necessary to maintain the temperature of the reaction at 100 degree centigrade for which we have a dry heat block here. We, you take your sample which you want to maintain at 100 degree and you just place it here like this and then it will be heated to 100 degree centigrade and will be maintained at that for however long you. You have already been introduced to the dry heat block, but apart from that we also have water baths in our laboratory where, so this is the water bath and so this portion of the tank has water which is maintained at, for now it is maintained at 42 degree centigrade. That is because uh, later on today what I will be doing is, I will be doing an experiment in which I require the temperature to be at 42 degree. I will take my sample in a centrifuge tube and I will just keep it inside this water bath. It will float inside the water bath and the reaction uh, will be incubated at 42 degrees. So, not just 42 degree, for some purposes it might be required at 56 degrees, for some purposes it might be required at 35 degrees. So, you can adjust the temperature and use the water bath for that sort of purpose. So, what we have here is a gel rocker. So, basically as you can see, this is an instrument which has a rocking platform on which we keep our different boxes. So, inside our boxes we already have uh, different SDS page gels and 
you see a blue liquid inside the box, right? So the gel is kept and on the top of that we have added the stain or the de-stain and this uniform rocking motion ensures that the entire gel is being properly exposed to the uh, stain solution. Apart from that, sometimes when we need to coat a surface with an antibody, what we can do is we can take that in a reaction tube and leave it here and the, in, uh, the rocking motion caused by this instrument ensures proper mixing. So I, am, I understand that you might not be familiar with many of the experimental terms that I used, but that is not the point for the, at this uh, moment. What I want you to realize is we have instruments which ensure proper mixing of different liquids onto solid surfaces or between each other via this gel rocker. What I have in front of me now is a centrifuge, it is a temperature control centrifuge and its uh, purpose is to centrifuge different samples. And this is a temperature control centrifuge which means we can maintain it at 25 degrees centigrade or lower maybe 4 degrees or 16 degrees or even if required slightly higher. So we can centrifuge solutions using such centrifuges and you will be seeing in the subsequent lectures that centrifugation is a very essential process required for many different experimental purposes in the laboratory. And so this is just one sort of centrifuge as, a, as we will be showing you there are different types of centrifuges and the principle of centrifugation remains the same. The only difference is some of them like this one might be refrigerated, some might not be refrigerated, some of them can handle larger sample volume, some of them can handle very small sample volumes and so on. So the earlier centrifuge that I showed you had a swing out bucket, I could not show it to you because the machine was running. But here what you can see in this centrifuge is it has a fixed angle rotor. So as you can see these small holes, inside these holes we can place small Eppendorf tubes and right now the machine is switched off. But what will happen is once I put the centrifuge tubes here, the machine rotates and as you can see the centrifuge tube which has been placed here or which will be placed here will always remain at a constant angle. So that is why this is called a fixed angle rotor. And so this centrifuge works in a similar fashion to the earlier centrifuge and I will be showing you some other centrifuges subsequently. This centrifuge here has a different type of rotor. So till now what you have seen is centrifuge rotors which can accommodate centrifuge tubes, 1.5 ml centrifuge tubes. There are rotors which can accommodate 15 ml falcon tubes or 50 ml conical falcon tubes, but this rotor that I will be showing you here is a bit different because this can actually accommodate 96 well plates. For many type of experimental purposes, you might need to centrifuge samples kept inside 96 well plates and for that purpose this sort of centrifuge rotor is necessary. For certain experiments, it is necessary to carry out the reactions under ice cold conditions. For that we need ice makers or ice flake machines. So this small instrument here does exactly that, it is connected to a water supply source and what it does is it creates flake ice for us. Let me just show you. So as you can see I just took out some ice, so flaked ice which we take inside these ice buckets. And so this is a very underappreciated but very essential component of the laboratory because if you do not have ice cold conditions, many reactions will not work and making ice cubes on in normal refrigerators is laborious and time consuming and does not really suit the purpose. So often it is quite essential to have ice flake machines which will take water supply directly from the tap and they will convert it into flake dice which you can then just take out and use. Another very important and basic requirement for molecular biology or biochemical experimental work is the usage of proper quality of water. You cannot just use tap water and carry out different reactions or carry out different experiments because you do not know what ions or minerals or what the pH of the water in the tap is. So for that purpose, 
you will require deionized water and what I have in front of me are a set of different instruments this one, this one, that one, all of which are working in tandem to provide us with deionized water, purified deionized water. So, I will not talk too much about the internal components, but basically what it does is the tap water source that is coming to the laboratory, initially the as you can see here iron removal uh, cylinder is here. So, what it does is it removes the iron and other heavy impurities, heavy metal impurities. Apart from that inside this component of the water filtration system, there are filters having pore sizes of maybe 5 micron or 2 micron or both and what they do is they remove the large size particles, they remove the uh, sedimented particles, they remove uh, impurities from the water. Apart from that inside this machine they carry out the deionization, so they remove all the ions using different expensive membrane filters and finally, the purified deionized water that is present is stored in this tank from which we can take as per our requirement. So, this is the general principle we have a particular company's uh, water purification unit, but there are different companies which build similar instruments and they all work on the same basic principle. And always keep in mind that the water which you are using for setting up your experimental uh, reactions needs to be deionized, it should not just be taken from the tap and used directly. So, now I am going to demonstrate how to actually use a pipette in the lab. So, I am going to take a 100 to 1000 microliter pipette and let us say I want to collect 1 ml of a particular solution and then dispense it into my desired container. It is first of all let us set it at 1000, suppose it was set lesser we just go up and set it at 1000 microliters. Whenever you are working with pipettes always ensure that you are holding it in this position do not hold it like this or do not hold it like this while the pipette is affixed because that could lead to liquids rolling in your instrument. Always hold it like this, set it at the proper volume and then what you need to do is you take out your tip box, notice what I am doing here. You slide down the lower portion of your pipette, it will fit very nicely into the tip, give a slight twisting motion while you are pressing down and the tip will automatically get attached to the pipette. You lift it up and you have your tip attached to your pipette man. So, another thing that you need to know is this piston can go up and down depending on the pressure that I exert with my thumb. So, when you are using a pipette you will notice that as you keep exerting pressure the piston keeps on going down until it meets a initial resistance which we call as first stop. Once it has reached there you can actually exert a bit more force and go down until it reaches a second resistance which we call a second stop. So, this is useful when we are dispensing liquids. For collecting liquids what you should do is you should press down the plunger or the piston until it reaches the first stop, hold it there and then you dip it into your tube. So, I want to collect this liquid, I want to collect this liquid, I am going down, pressing down until I reach the first stop and then what you should do is, do not dip it deeply into the liquid, do not go in so deep, that is not good practice. Do not do it too much at the surface because then you take the risk of collecting air bubbles which will put errors in the volume that you are calculating. So, a good idea is to just dip it maybe half a centimeter inside the liquid and then gently, but uniformly release the pressure of your thumb on the piston. As you keep releasing the pressure, the piston keeps moving up and you are actually collecting the desired volume that you have calibrated the instrument to collect. So, I have set it at 1000 and what I have here is 1000 microliters of this particular solution, which I am now going to dispense into the tube where I want it. In this case you take it, you put it in your tube, you gently press back until you reach first stop, 
then you go in for the second stop. You exert a bit more pressure, you go in for the second stop, hold for one or two seconds and then you take out your tip. And now, we have achieved what we went out to do. We now have one ml of this solution in this container using this pipette. Another thing is after you have finished using your pipette, suppose you had used your pipette at 800 microliters. You needed 800 microliter of that solution and you collected it. Do not leave it like this because that will damage the internal spring mechanism that is present in this uh, instrument. When you are done working with the pipette, always keep it in its released condition. The released condition corresponds to the maximum volume that can be pipet, pipetted out with that instrument. In this case, 1000 microliter is the maximum volume that we can collect. Always release it or keep it when not in use at 1000 microliter. Any other volume that you keep it at will cause undue compression on the internal mechanisms and damage your instrument. This is applicable for all the different pipettes here. For 1 to 10, it will be kept at 10 microliter when not at use. For 10 to 100, you keep it at 100 microliter when not at use and so on. So, I had been talking about collecting 1 ml. Suppose I want to collect 5 ml or say 10 ml of a particular solution. In which case, instead of using this 10 times, I would like to use this once. This pipette controller does not use these sort of tips. Instead, they use serological pipettes. So, this is present in a sterile format. It is present in a sealed condition. Once we break the seal, we have to use it up. So, I am going to just take out this serological pipette, affix it to this and remove it and this is what we are going to use. You will notice that this can collect a volume of up to 10 milliliters. So, let us do that. The way this operates is, you will notice that this has two buttons. The upper button when you press, it will withdraw fluid. When you stop, it will hold it in that particular volume and when you press the lower volume, lower button, it is going to dispense the liquid. Let me demonstrate. So, I will dip it into this solution and when I am pressing the upper button C, I am actually collecting liquid from here. Say I want around 10 ml, I just take it here and when I want to dispense it, I put it into this tube and now I will press the lower button. Once I press it, it gets dispensed. So, yeah, if you press it hard, it gets ejected rapidly. If you press it slowly, it gets. Let me show it again. I am collecting the liquid. Oh, see, I was talking about an error, right? If I do not dip it properly, you saw what happened? Air bubbles entered the serological pipe. So, I do not want that. So, dip it in nicely. Perhaps, I am sure it is visible now. Dip it in nicely and you go it at, at an uniform pace. You are collecting the liquid and dispense slowly. You can dispense drop by drop or if I increase the pressure, I can di dispense of the liquid as a jet. So, this is how we use pipette controllers to pipette out comparatively larger volumes of liquids. In this case, you do not have to worry about releasing the pipette be because this does not work on that mechanism, but in these cases, even for multi channel pipettes and single channel pipettes, you always need to keep the pipette in the released condition when not in use. So, I just showed you how to affix a pipette tip to the pipette. After using it, we need to detach this, which we call as ejecting the pipette tip away from the pipette. It can be done very easily. You will notice that this region slides when I apply pressure. And as I apply pressure, this moves down. When I apply sufficient pressure, the pipette tip falls off. That is how we eject tips from pipettes. 
I was also talking about the multi-channel pipette. Remember, which can use, this one can use eight tips at a, at a single go. Suppose I want to collect 100 microliters, eight times, instead of doing it eight times, I can do it, it in one go. In which case, you align the nozzles with the tips, you press down, slight motion and see. You actually have volumes here. So the idea is, I don't have anything to show you right now, but what happens is, in many uh, aspects of molecular biology or biochemistry, you will be using 96 well plates. Suppose you have to collect a particular solution from here in equal volume. At that time, you dip it in here. I know it's empty, but I'm just showing you the utility. You dip it in here, you collect the liquid, and then you dispense it somewhere else. And once it's done, you eject all the tips simultaneously. Hello, I'm Snigdha Maithi. I'm a senior research fellow of School of Bioscience. I'm working under the supervision of Dr. Shomode. I'm one of the designated TA for the course of NPTEL Experimental Biochemistry. Hopefully, this course will help you in your research and we could help you. Thank you. Hello, today I will show you how to uh, use a pH meter and how to measure on the pH of a solution. So for that we have a pH meter here and in this monitor you can see the pH reading, also the temperature and the volt. And along with the monitor we will have an electrode uh, which uh, have to be cleaned before we start using it. So for that we will remove the electrode from the storing solution which is provided by the manufacturer and we will clean it with deionized water, uh, rinse it. And then with the help of a tissue paper, we will wipe it down so that the electrode is dry. So now that I have already mentioned you about the pH meter, so this is a digital pH meter and uh, the probe should be always kept inside the solution, uh, storing solution. So basically the storing solution will be provided by the manufacturer, different uh, pH companies of pH meter, they uh, everyone provide this storing solution and this is a solution of 3 molar or 4 molar potassium chloride solution. So keep it in mind that the probe should be always moist, otherwise if it, it becomes dry, it will damage the probe and it will not get the accurate result. So from the storing solution, this big container, I have taken out small volume of the storing solution and kept it in a small container and for storing this probe for um, long time, I have kept uh, dipped the probe inside the storing solution. Now. Before we start measuring a pH of a particular solution or a uh, experiment, we, you should always need to know if the pH meter is properly calibrated or not. At a regular interval, all the instruments should be cleaned and calibrated, otherwise accurate pH will not be shown. So for that today, uh, right now I will be showing how to calibrate your pH meter using three different solutions and this is known as the three point calibration method. So for that, Again, the manufacturers have provided us the different uh, solution. One is uh, of pH 4.0, one, one. Another one is uh, pH 7 and the other one is 10.01. So all these uh, solutions are basically buffered and from these three bottles, I have taken out or allocated small volume of these solutions into three falcon tubes. So now I will be showing how using these three solutions, will be uh, calibrating our pH meter. So in order to do the pH meter calibration, first I will take out the probe from the storing solution. And as I mentioned earlier, before you dip the probe in any solution, you have to wash thoroughly with deionized water. Now while washing, do not uh, damage the probe, always use deionized water. So after you wash the probe, then you dab it with a clean tissue paper. Do not rub the uh, probe, otherwise you might damage the probe and it is very sensitive and fragile. And then you open the small cap. So this is a refillable uh, probe where inside this probe there is uh, an electrolyte, reference electrolyte. And uh, before you start measuring any pH, you should open this uh, now. 
Now I am using a standard uh, solution of pH 4.0 and then I will dip this probe inside this solution. Now be very careful how much you dip the probe inside this solution. The probe should be or the bulb should be absolutely immersed inside the solution. Do not dip it till here otherwise this buffer might go inside your probe. So dip it until the probe is fully immersed inside the solution. And then in this monitor we will put there is a calibration uh, setup and we will press the calibration setup. And now it will show uh, one point. So if you then start it will start uh, getting the pH of that particular solution. Now you have to wait for some time before this reading becomes stabilized. Do not rush here otherwise it might be inaccurate. So this is blinking right now until and unless it stabilizes wait till that. For example, if you ever need to transfer liquid volumes, you probably use a pipetter, also known as a pipette. Pipettes come in a range of sizes and can accurately transport volumes as small as 0.2 or as large as 1000 microliters. The volume range of each pipette is shown on top of its plunger. For example, this P20 pipette can transfer 2 to 20 microliters. Sometimes only the maximum volume of the pipette is shown on the plunger. But the volume range of all pipettes is tenfold, so this pipette transfers 10 to 100 microliters. To change the volume setting on a pipette, rotate the black knob near the top, as shown here. Note that since this is a P1000 pipette, one of the digits is shown in red to indicate milliliters. The other two digits are shown in black for microliters. Right now the pipette is set to 1 ml. On a P20 pipette, one of the digits is red to represent nanoliters, while the other two digits are shown in black for microliters. In this example, the pipette is set to 18.7 microliters. On a P2 pipette, two of the digits are shown in red and one is in black for microliters. In this example, the pipette is currently set to 1.32 microliters. Just as pipettes have unique volume ranges, they also require unique tips. For example, this P1000 requires large blue tips. Always make sure that the tips fit on snugly. If the tips fit on loosely or fall off, then they won't work properly and you'll need to find some other tips. Pipettes use a two-stop plunger system to transfer liquids. The first stop, as shown here, is used to draw up the liquid. The second stop is used to completely eject the liquid from the tip. So once again, the first stop is used to draw up liquid, while the second stop is used to eject it. When transferring a sample, begin by pushing the plunger down to the first stop to eject all of the air. Then submerge the tip and release the plunger. As you eject the sample, push all the way to the second stop to make sure that all the liquid leaves the tip. When you are done using the tip, Eject it into a sharps box using the ejector button, as shown here. If your pipette does not have a working ejector button, you can always take off the tip manually by hand. If you ever think a pipette is inaccurate, you can test it using an analytical balance. In this example, we're going to test a P1000 pipette by setting it to 700 microliters. Since the density of water is 1 gram per ml, 700 microliters of water should weigh 700 milligrams. Begin by tearing a weigh boat and then slowly transferring the liquid volume to the weigh boat. Make sure you completely eject all of the liquid, then close the doors on the analytical balance and wait for the reading to stabilize. In this case, the reading is only 541 milligrams, which is much less than the expected 700 milligrams. Therefore, the pipette is in dire need of calibration. You should no longer use the pipette for any experiments and immediately let your supervisor know that the pipette needs to be calibrated. If you need to transfer volumes larger than 1 ml, you'll need to use a pipette aid. Pipette aids use much larger tips with volume ranges from 2 to 50 ml. Begin by tightly inserting the tip into the pipette aid, then submerge the tip into the liquid. 
Draw liquid up with the top button and eject liquid with the bottom button. If at any point you draw liquid too far up, the pipette will stop working. This is because all pipette aids use an air filter to protect themselves from liquid contamination. Therefore, to get the pipette aid working again, you have to disassemble the pipette head and remove the clogged filter, as shown here. Once you've removed the clogged filter, you'll need to replace it with a new filter. Note that syringe filters designed for liquid will not work properly in a pipette aid. You must use the air filter specifically designed for your pipette aid. Once you have removed the old clogged filter and thoroughly dried all of the plastic pieces, reassemble the pipette aid, making sure that the new filter and all the rubber pieces are in the correct orientation. Once you put it back together, test it with some liquid to make sure that it works. If the pipette aid continues to malfunction, let your supervisor know immediately. In addition to transferring liquid volumes, you also have to weigh out a variety of chemicals in your research. To do so, we use balances. Most labs have two types of balances, a crude balance for large masses and an analytical balance for very small masses. It is very important that you only weigh large masses on the crude balance and small masses on the analytical balance. This is because large masses will actually break the analytical balance, while the crude balance is not accurate enough to precisely weigh small masses. To weigh masses larger than one gram, use a weigh boat. Insert the weigh boat into the analytical balance, close all the doors, and tear it to set the mass to zero. Then add your chemical. To weigh masses smaller than a gram, use a weighing paper. Weighing papers are preferred because they cling less to small powders and crystals. Transfer your chemical to the weigh paper using a clean spatula or scupula as shown here. Slowly add the chemical to the weigh paper to prevent going over the desired weight. Check the exact weight by closing the doors on the analytical balance and giving it a few seconds to stabilize. As long as your spatula is clean, you may return any excess chemical to the original bottle it came from. If you are ever weighing out a chemical and you accidentally spill some of it on the balance or bench, you'll need to clean it up immediately. Begin by removing your weighed out chemical from the balance. Then use a brush to clean up any spilt powder or crystals. Once you have it all cleaned up, make sure you properly dispose of the chemical. Just like a pipetter, an analytical balance can also become inaccurate over time. To test the accuracy of an analytical balance, you'll need two standardized weights at the upper and lower bounds of the balance. In this case, we're using 2 and 50 gram weights. Notice that the 2 gram weight is reading 1.998 grams, which is less than 1% inaccurate, so that's pretty good. Next, we test the 50 gram weight, which weighs out to be 49.95 grams. This is also greater than 99.9% .9 accurate, so the balance is working properly. If these readings were significantly off, we would need to calibrate the balance. Refer the manufacturer's instructions on how to do so, or let your supervisor know immediately. So just to review, use crude balances for large weights, which is typically anything over about 5 grams. Use analytical balances for any small weights, anything from 0.1 milligram all the way up to a gram. And please clean off the balances and the bench if you spill any chemicals. Centrifuges are also commonly found in most labs. They're used to separate particles of different densities by spinning them rapidly to generate a high g-force. Since most centrifuges do operate at rather high speeds, it is important that you know how to properly use them to avoid damaging the centrifuge or harming yourself. The most important thing you need to know about using a centrifuge is that any samples you put on the rotor must be properly balanced. Use an analytical balance to make sure the weights of your samples are equivalent and adjust them as necessary. If you ever have an odd number of samples, you can always use a tube of water to even things out. When putting your samples on the rotor, make sure they are exactly opposite one another, otherwise you'll get an imbalance error. Next, put a lid on the rotor just in case any of your samples leak out. To set the speed on the centrifuge, always begin by selecting either G-force or RPM for revolutions per minute. Note that G-force may also be shown as RCF for relative centrifugal force. 
Next, set the time on the centrifuge and start the run. You should always stick around to watch the centrifuge reach maximum speed, just in case there's any kind of imbalance error. Once the centrifuge has finished, wait for the rotor to completely stop spinning, then remove your samples. You should always check your samples to make sure the desired sedimentation has occurred. When you're done with the centrifuge, put the rotor lid back in place and close the main lid. Whenever you're using larger centrifuges that use buckets or 50 ml tubes, it is important that you only fill them up to about 80% of their maximum volume. For instance, here we're only filling up the 50 ml tube to 40 ml. This is because tubes and buckets do not have perfect seals. Therefore, when they're spun at high speeds, they can leak out if they're overfilled. So to prevent making a huge mess that you have to clean up in the centrifuge, only fill up 50 ml tubes to 40 ml and fill 600 ml buckets to around 400 ml. So just to review, when using a centrifuge, always make sure that your samples are properly balanced. And finally, when using 50 ml tubes or large buckets, only fill them to 80% of their maximum volume to prevent any spills that might happen in the centrifuge. If a spill does occur, make sure that you clean it up immediately. The most important thing you need to know about a pH meter is that the electrode must be stored in electrode storage solution in between uses. If the electrode storage solution runs dry, then the pH meter will stop working properly and the electrode may even break. If you ever notice that the storage solution has run dry, immediately fill it back up with fresh electrode storage solution. Several companies offer pre-made storage solutions, or you can make your own by mixing 100 milligrams of potassium chloride with 10 ml of the pH4 standard solution. When you are ready to use the electrode, remove it from the storage solution and thoroughly dry it with a chem wipe. Next, rinse off the electrode with milliq water and dry it again. To calibrate the meter, pour a little bit of the standard solution into a 15 ml tube. This prevents the main standard solution from becoming contaminated. You can refer to the manufacturer's instructions for specific protocols on how to calibrate your pH meter. However, in general, pH standard solutions of 4, 7, and 10 are usually used to calibrate pH meters. When calibrating the meter, it is important that you use the two standard solutions that are closest to the pH of your buffer. For example, if you plan on making a sample with a pH of 6, you want to calibrate with the 4 and 7 standards. However, if the pH of your buffer will be 8.5, then you'll want to calibrate the meter with the pH 7 and 10 standard solutions. To measure pH, completely submerge the tip of the electrode into your solution and ensure that it is vigorously mixed. The best way to do this is to use a stir bar and a stir plate, but you can do it with your hand if those are unavailable. Remember to press the read button on the pH meter and give it a little while to stabilize. Once the reading has stabilized, you can adjust the pH of the solution with hydrochloric acid or sodium hydroxide. Note that hydrochloric acid will decrease the pH while sodium hydroxide will raise the pH. In either case, add the acid or base in small amounts and vigorously mix the solution after you add them. It is important that you add the acid and base in very small amounts such that you don't overshoot and have to add excess acid and base. This will prevent you from adding too much salt to your solution. Once you are done titrating your solution, remember to put the electrode back into the storage solution. I'd like to stop for a moment to talk specifically about buffers. The purpose of a buffer is to maintain the pH of a solution, even though a reaction may be occurring that would otherwise raise or lower the pH. The most important thing you need to know about buffers is that they are only effective within specific pH ranges. For example, bis-tris buffer is only effective between pH 5.8 and 7.3. Therefore, if you titrate it to pH 8, it will not resist pH change effectively. Instead, 
If you need to make a buffer at pH 8, it would be better to use TRIS-HCL, which has a range from 7.2 to 9. It is important to mention that the buffers shown in this table are only a small sampling of all the buffers available. You can find many more online which may be useful for your experiments. Aside from the pH range of a buffer, you should also consider its chemical reactivity. For example, TRIS buffers are weak chelators, that means they will weakly bind metal ions. In addition, HEAPS buffers generate free radicals that can significantly interfere with your chemical reaction if exposed to sunlight. Therefore, you should always remember to check the pH range and the reactivity of your buffer just to make sure it's ideal for the reaction that you're trying to do. If you work with any hazardous chemicals in your research, you'll probably need to use the fume hood at some point. To begin working in the fume hood, raise the sash to the maximum safe height. Note that if you raise it too high, the fume hood will not work properly and some vapors may escape into the lab. When you raise the sash, it should start drawing air inwards. If there is no airflow or any alarms go off in the hood, you should let your supervisor know immediately and not use the fume hood. When performing experiments in the fume hood, you should always work at least six inches deep. This will prevent any vapors from accidentally escaping from the fume hood. In addition, you should always keep the fume hood as clean and empty as possible. This will prevent hazardous chemicals from cross-reacting from one another, and it will ensure that the vents that you can see in the back of the fume hood here will remain unblocked and working properly. Remember, if these vents become blocked, the fume hood may lose suction and hazardous vapors may escape into the lab. So, to review, before working in the fume hood, always check the airflow of the hood. You should also work six inches deep at all times and try not to block any of the vents inside of the fume hood. Another commonly used piece of equipment in all of our labs is the UltraPure water system. UltraPure water should be used for all of your buffers, since tap water and even distilled water may have some contaminants that could interfere with your reactions. To collect UltraPure water, place the dispensing hose inside your bottle and pull the trigger as shown here. Do not let bottles fill up on the bench. Instead, put them in the sink just in case you forget about them and they overflow. Please note that if you do leave a bottle on the bench and it overflows, it can flood the lab, thereby damaging or ruining many expensive pieces of lab equipment. When collecting ultra-pure water, you should always check the readout on the system to ensure that the water is ultra-pure. Ultra-pure water has a resistivity of 18.2 mega ohms per centimeter, as shown on the readout here. If the resistivity is any lower, that means your water is not ultra-pure and one of the filters in the system will likely need to be replaced. Notify your supervisor if this is the case. Also notify your supervisor if you observe any alarms on the system. Once you have your ultra-pure water, you probably use a stir plate to make your solution. Begin by inserting a stir bar that isn't too big or too small for the bottle. Then slowly turn up the RPMs and add your chemical that you wish to dissolve. In some cases, you may wish to heat the sample as well. Please remember to use extreme caution when heating liquids on a hot plate. For example, do not heat water above its boiling point, which can be 90 to 100 degrees C, unless you are explicitly trying to boil it. Volatile solvents should only be heated in the chemical fume hood to avoid inhalation of any harmful vapors. Finally, hot plates should not be left on at high temperatures for extended periods of time. For example, try not to leave a hot plate on overnight, since it is not uncommon for hot plates to overheat and create a fire hazard when left unattended. So that's the end of this video. I hope it's been useful. Please contact your advisor if you have any more questions on any of these pieces of equipment. Hello, my name is Mark Temple, and I'm just going to give you a quick um, introduction to pipetting small volumes. Now to understand small volumes you also need to understand the units of volume. So typically we talk about liters, like a bottle of water might be a liter, but in molecular biology or biology generally 
we tend to work in smaller volumes, such as milliliters, which would be like um, a small sip from a bottle, or we talk about microliters, which may be a drop from the bottle. So this is a brief guide to using the micro pipettas. And these here are some examples of micro pipettas. So the first decision you need to make is which pipetta is the correct one for the volume which you want to dispense. Okay. Now, if we look at one of these pipettas here, this is a P1000, a pipetta 1000. And I call it a P1000 because on the little cap here, it says P1000. That refers to the volume, the maximum volume that you can dispense with this pipetta. So the P1000 can dispense a thousand units of something. Okay, that's a thousand microliters. Okay, there are 1000 microliters in one milliliter. Therefore, the maximum volume this can dispense is one milliliter, which is the same as a thousand microliters. This is a very similar pipetta, but this one dispenses a smaller volume. And if you read the top here, it's a P200, meaning the maximum volume it can dispense is 200 microliters, which is the same as 0.2 of a milliliter. Okay? So, if you look at these in comparison, you can see straight away the difference. The, um, this pipetta here has a much wider barrel and can dispense a much larger volume, up to a milliliter or 1,000 microliters. This one has a much narrower barrel and can dispense a smaller volume up to 0.2 of a mil or 200 microliters. So this is the P1000 and this is the P200, named according to the maximum volume they can dispense expressed in microliters. Okay, so let's assume I want to dispense a volume of say 800 microliters. Clearly I'm going to be using a P1000 because it's greater than 200 microliters and it's less than 1000 microliters. So 800 microliters. Okay. There's a scale on these and the scale here is at its maximum setting is clearly going to represent 1000 microliters. So this is set to 1000 microliters and the unit here is 1 100. So um, the zero for the smaller volume is not shown. So 100 on this scale refers to 1,000 microliters. And therefore 90 on this scale would refer to 900 microliters. And we want to dispense 800 microliters. So the 0 0.80, if you think of the red digit as um, one as expressing milliliters then the decimal place would be after the the um, the red digit and it would be 0.8 of a mil or 800 microliters if I wanted to dispense 180 microliters I would use the P200 okay I would not use the P1000 to dispense anything that's in the range of this pipetta because this is designed to pipette between 200 and maybe, I don't know, maybe 20 microliters, maybe 10 if you're desperate. Okay, so if I want to dispense 180 microliters, I can see here from the wheel that it's, it's, it's about halfway. So it's a P200, it's set about halfway, it's reading 100 here. So clearly, 100 refers to 100 microliters. Okay, so 180, I'll just wind it up until that number reaches 180. There you go, 180. 
So that's going to dispense 180 units of something, and that is 180 microliters. Okay, the next thing you need to be clear on when using the pets is putting the right tip onto the, um, the bottom of the pipette. So this is a, a pipette, but it doesn't have a tip on the end, so it can't be used until it's fitted with its tip. So here is a box of tips. This is um, what a blue tip looks like. These tips fit the P1000, and you'll notice that the diameter here matches the diameter here. So it just clips on. All right. So effectively, what you do is just lightly put it on. Okay. So the P, that this large um, plastic tip fits the P1000. Okay. If you try to take the P200 onto the blue tip, it's not going to fit. Okay. Clearly, that is not designed to fit. Right. And likewise, the P200 perfectly fits these yellow tips. Okay. So, um, so here you have one of, the, one of the yellow tips. Okay. And again, the, the yellow tip doesn't fit anywhere close to isn't anywhere close to fitting the P1000. So, when you use these pipettes, you only ever use them when the tip is attached, and it's only the tip that you're going to immerse into the solution that you're going to transfer from one container to another container. Okay. Let's assume I want to pipette a volume of 180 microliters. Clearly, I'm going to use the P200 for that. Let's put a tip on there. Okay, so we're ready to go. We've got a tip on there. Okay, now there are two positions that this plunger will work at. Okay, there's the first one, and then there's the second one, which is. All right. The first one is calibrated. So when I when I dispense it to the first position, it's going to dispense the volume that's written on this scale here. So that's the first position. The second position is not calibrated, it's just an extra bit of push that dispenses a little bit more air out to expel the solution from the tip. So you don't use that when you're drawing the solution up. You only use the calibrated position to draw the solution up, and then when you dispense, you dispense all the way down. So let's have a look. Okay, so here's the um, pipetta. I'm going to take it down to the first volume, which is the calibrated volume here. I'm going to immerse the tip under the solution, then I'm going to draw the solution up. Okay. So I'm dispensing down to the first position. I'm immersing it just below the volume, um, just below the top surface. And then I'm slowly drawing that up. And if you look here, you'll see quite clearly that we um, have, a, have a volume of 180 microliters in here. Keep the pipette in the vertical orientation when you're doing this. If you um, let me just dispense it, to dispense it, I go down all the way to the second position. So I dispense it by going like this. So you'll see here, go So to summarize, to draw up solution, you go down to the first stop. You immerse the tip. You draw it up slowly, and there's your 200 or 180 microliters, and then you can dispense the solution. Okay. When you're working with these pipettes, and you've, um, you know, just imagine you've just drawn up a solution. You have a, you have a wet solution in here. If you hold it at an angle like that, 
Okay, the solution is going to run down the barrel into the machine, and that's going to damage, and you're going to have to clean out the machine, and it's a lot of time and effort. Okay, so when you have a solution in here, you keep them in the vertical orientation. Okay, to remove the tip, there's a, a, a button here. Okay, if you just put a bit of pressure down on it with your finger, it will just pop the tip off. Okay, so um, there we go. So normally you'd have a, um, a waste bin and you would just dispense your tip into the waste bin. All right. Um, let's just quickly repeat that procedure with the P1000. Say I want, I want to pipette um, something greater than 180 microliters because I would use the P200 for 180. Let's assume 500 microliters, half a milliliter. Okay. Simply place your tip down to the first position here. Immerse. Slowly relieve the pressure on your thumb to draw up the 500 microliters. Keep the pipetta in the vertical orientation to avoid the solution running up into the pipetta. To dispense, you go back down to the calibrated stop and then just down to blow out that extra bit of air, put a bit more pressure on it. Okay. So again, to draw up the solution, it's simply a matter of going down to the first stop and then immersing, then drawing up, then transferring to where you want to transfer, and then going all the way down. And you can draw up slowly, and you can be a little more firm when you're dispensing. Um, often you'll get bubbles on the end, um, Depending on what you're dispensing, I often um, dispense onto the side of the container, and that way you tend not to get residue left in the tip. Okay, so as a brief introduction to using micro pipettas, hopefully that will suffice. Okay. Important things are the choice of the right pipetta for the volume that you want to dispense. The next thing you need to be aware of is setting the appropriate volume here on the dial and not getting confused by the number. Okay, And to help with confusion, have a look at the maximum volume it can dispense and what the maximum scale is. And then if it's a P1000 and it's showing 100, then obviously that 100 represents 1000. And therefore, 90 represents 900. For some of them, it's easier. P200, the maximum unit here is 200, and therefore 200 on the scale is 200 microliters. 180 on the scale is 180 microliters. Be sure to use the correct tip for the pipetta. There are various size tips. I've shown you two here. The blue one is for the P1000. The yellow one is for the P200. When you're using any of these pipettas, you um, place a tip on, you set your dial to the volume, you then move the plunger down to the calibrated stop, you immerse into your solution, you slowly draw up your solution. I've got a bit of air in there, so I'll just dispense that out and I'll pay more attention to the solution and not the camera. So I go down to the first stop on the pipetta here. I then immerse and slowly draw up the solution. I then go to the, dis the, the other thing I'm dispensing into and I dispense the solution into that. And then I use this other button here to dispense the tip so that I can dispense the tip into a waste container, not into my hand. So, um, and, and again, keep the pipette upright whilst you're pipetting to avoid any backflow into the um, into the pipette itself. 
Um, be careful when you're winding. It's very easy to overwind these things. Some people say, well, I don't understand what I'm doing, and I've got a P200 here, but this scale only goes up to 200. I want to wind it up to 500 because you're confused. You think it's 50 or whatever. And if you keep winding this thing here, which I'm not going to do, then this um, wheel here will start to exert a lot of pressure in that orientation outside of where you can, you know, um, hold it comfortably and you're going to damage the machine. So never wind this little wheel here too far up or too far down and always be aware of where you are on the scale. So it's often a good idea to be looking at the scale whilst you're winding and be aware of what the maximum um, capacity of the capetta. Pepetta. All right, well, hopefully that helps, and um, yeah, good luck in your experiments. Okay, thank you. This week in the biology lab, you're going to be using micropipettes. Micropipettes are equipment that biologists often use for doing biochemical reactions. They're used for measuring very small volumes of liquid, things like nucleic acids, which we're going to use in lab. We're going to be isolating DNA. Or you could be pipetting radioactive substances or bacteriological substances, bacteria or viruses. So it's very important to learn how to use them accurately and safely. In lab, we're going to be using three different sizes of micropipettes. A P20, and you'll notice that on the top of the plunger, it has the size of the pipette. It says P20. This delivers two microliters to 20 microliters of fluid. We'll also be using a P200. Again, P200 is listed on the top of the plunger. P200s are used for measuring 20 microliters to 200 microliters of fluid. The last size micropipette that we'll be using is the P1000. Notice that that says P1000 on the plunger, and it measures 200 to 1000 microliters of fluid accurately. Each of the pipetters has a series of three numbers on the barrel. And this is how you set the volume that you want to use. Some of the numbers are black and some will be red. The red numbers indicate that you have to be alert. We'll start with the P200 first because that's the easiest one to set. On the P200, you have three black numbers on the dial and essentially what you see is what you get. If the pipetter is set at 100, that will measure 100 microliters. If you wanted 200 microliters, you would set it at 200. 50 microliters would be 050. To set the pipette, you turn the barrel until the numbers appear in the window for the volume that you want. So I'm going to set this at 100 microliters, or 100. Now let's look at the P1000. The P1000 also has three numbers, but notice that the top number is in red. So that's an alert signal. The top number is not 100s, it's thousands. So 100 is not 100 microliters, it's 1,000 microliters. If you wanted 500 microliters, that would be 050 on the P1000. So remember, the red number is thousands, and you have to make sure that you know how to set the pipette when you are setting your volume. The third pipette that we'll be using is the P20, which measures accurately 2 microliters to 20 microliters. This also has three numbers on the barrel. But notice that the bottom number is in red. That is an alert that tells you that bottom number is tenths. So there's a decimal point before that number. So if it, the dial reads 100, that stands for 10.0 or 10 microliters. If you wanted to measure 2 microliters, you'd set the dial on 020. 0, 0.
Just for your information, your lab manual in the appendix also has the directions for how to set the pipettes and it also has diagrams of each of the pipettes. So if you need that, you can, you can look at that in lab and remind yourself how these pipettes should be set. It's very important to set the pipette correctly or else you might be pipetting the wrong amount of liquid and therefore your biochemical reaction is not going to work very well. Now I'm going to show you how to actually use the pipettes to measure a specified volume. I want you to notice that the pipettes are color coded and that on the top of the plunger you'll see either a yellow dot on the P20 and the P200 you have a yellow dot on the plunger on the P1000 you have a blue dot. The, this color coding tells you which size and which color pipette tips to use. If your pi micro pipette has a blue dot, you use the larger blue tips. If your micro pipette has a yellow dot on the top, you use the smaller yellow tips. In lab, because we're going to be using DNA, we don't want to contaminate our samples with anything on our hands. Sometimes your hands have DNases and RNases which could destroy nucleic acids. So we're going to wear gloves to do our pipetting. And you should always wear gloves if you're using anything toxic or any microbiologicals such as bacteria or, or viruses because you don't want to contaminate yourself or the sample. I'm going to use the P200 and we're going to pipette 100 microliters. So I've set this to 100 microliters, 100, and I'm going to put a yellow tip on the micropipette. Press the micropipette down onto the tip. You don't even have to touch the tip. Lift it out of the box and then you just might want to make sure that the tip is tight. You want it to be tight because if it's loose you might pull up bubbles or the tip might fall off. The other thing to notice about the pipettes is that there are two stops on the plunger. This is the plunger. If you press the plunger to the first stop, it goes down pretty easily. If you press the plunger to the second stop, it's a little bit harder. And I'll tell you what that's for as we go through the demonstration for how to use it. One other thing to remember is you never want to touch the tip of your pipette to the table or touch it with your, with your gloved hands or touch it to anything else except the reagents that you're using because you, again you don't want to contaminate the environment and you don't want the environment to contaminate your sample. Another thing you should never do is turn your pipette tip up like this. If you do that the fluid in the tip will flow down into the pipetter it will contaminate the pipette and if you're using radioactivity or bacteriologicals that means we now have to take the pipette apart, clean it out and start over and recalibrate it. So always hold your pipette tip in this position or at an angle with the tip down. So we're going to take some of our sample. You're going to depress the plunger to the first stop, put the pipette tip into the fluid and you want to make sure that your tip is below the surface of the fluid, well below the surface of the fluid. You don't want to get the pipetter itself wet, you don't want it to go in too deep, but you want it to go in deep enough so that when you pull up the liquid into the tip you're not sucking up air. You don't want to get bubbles in the tip. So I pushed it down the plunger to the first stop, my pipette tip is under the surface of the fluid, I'm now going to slowly release the plunger and pull my sample up into my pet, my pet tip. I now have 100 microliters of accurately measured sample in my pipette tip. I'll then take a microfuge tube and I will put the tip into the tube and I will now depress the plunger again and release the sample into the tube. And you may be able to see that there's just a tiny, tiny drop, hardly even noticeable, still left in the tip of the pipette. This is where you depress it to the second stop to push out that last drop. When you've finished adding your solution to the tube, you 
will eject the tip into the waste bucket by pressing down on the tip ejector. This way you never actually have to touch the tip from the time that you take it out of the tip box until the time that you have finished your pipetting. And that way if you're working with toxic chemicals or bacteriologicals you're not going to get contaminate anything. Something that biologists often do when they're pipetting is they look at what they're pipetting and they check to make sure that they've pipetted the right amount in the tip. In other words, once I've pipetted 100 microliters over and over, I know what 100 microliters looks like in the tip. So I should be checking the tip to make sure that there are no bubbles and that we have 100 microliters in the tip. You should also check your test tubes. To, if you're pipetting multiple tubes with the same volume, you can check the tubes to make sure that all of the tubes are the same volume. And if they're not the same volume, you can redo that tube and make sure that you don't make a mistake uh, before you go any further with your experiment. So you should always check the volume as you're pipetting and check the volume in your tube when you're finished. In lab, you'll be able to have time to practice all these um, activities before you actually do the experiments. And thanks for watching and we'll see you in lab. Hello, my name is Amanda Grimes and I'm here from the Mesa High Biotech Academy in Mesa, Arizona. And I'm here to share with you how to use a pipette. We want to make sure that you know how to use this very common piece of equipment and how to teach your students how to use it more effectively. It's pretty commonly used in forensic labs and research labs all over the world and yet with just a few simple techniques you can help increase your accuracy and make it a better tool to use with your students for biotechnology, especially those that want to go into some sort of research or forensic science career. So I'm here today to talk about pipetting with you and most of my students when I talk about a pipette this is what they think of. This is pretty much all they use in biology unless you're from a program that has a really great biotech program and those teachers share with your kids. And so we want to toss this one out the window and we want to get them using some really cool pipetters. These are a really great tool. They're used in research labs, forensic labs, chemistry labs, any kind of lab in the world are going to use these air displacement pipettes. And so I'm going to show you how they work a little bit, how to use them, talk about some common errors that students may have and how to fix them. So this is a pipetter. You always want to make sure that you've got a tip on it when you use it, but so I want to get you acquainted with how it works. There's always going to be this hook back here that's going to hook over your hand, okay, and you're going to depress the plunger with your thumb. On the pipette there are actually two stops, so you can push once and then twice, okay. And so there's are very creatively named the first stop and the second stop. And so you want to make sure that when you're filling your pipetter, you know which stop you're at. And so you want to make sure that first stop is very well ingrained with your students. And so I like to do a little bit of biotech exercise, thumb aerobics, and practice having them only going to the first stop up and down about five or ten times so they get used to it. So the first thing is always use a tip on your pipetter. And I just teach my students with food coloring. So I label my tubes that to say practice dye. And food coloring is a very inexpensive way to get some color into your lab. I'm going to go ahead and go to my first stop again. This always is going to be at eye level. So you want to train your students right here. This is the pipetting zone. The tip needs to go just under the surface of the liquid. And at eye level, slowly raise from the first stop up. Okay, training your students to always recover their samples before pipetting into a new tube. Okay, proper dispensing is going to be to the second stop. And in order to dispense properly, you actually want to touch the side of the tube. Slowly go to your first stop. You can see there may be a little bit of liquid left in there. Second stop, keep that plunger depressed Slowly let go back up, take your thumb off, and eject. Okay. Now, one of the common problems I see my students do because I train them to touch when they eject, they often want to try to touch the walls of the tube 
as they are getting their samples. And so we have to train our students to make sure that when they're getting sample, they're right in the middle, not touching the walls. Again, because of the cohesive and adhesive properties of water, we want to make sure that they're not doing that. They want to make sure to draw their sample right from the middle with the tip just under the surface of the liquid, keeping that pipetter as vertical as possible once there's a sample in it. When they dispense, again, everything at eye level, they do want to touch because we want the water to stick to itself. And so we're going to go to the first stop and second stop. Keep your thumb pressed down, then release and dispose of your tip. Gilson or thin micropipettas are one of the most commonly used instruments in a molecular biology laboratory. They're used in conjunction with plastic disposable pipette tips to measure or transfer small amounts of liquids, usually from 0.2 microliters to 1,000 microliters or 1 milliliter. Different pipettes work across different ranges of volumes and are named by the maximum volume they pipette. The different pipettes look very similar, so they're labelled on the top of each push button with a capital P, followed by a number which indicates the maximum volume for that particular pipette. A P2 pipettes between 0.2 and 2 microliters. A P20 pipettes between 2 and 20 microliters. A P200 pipettes between 20 and 200 microliters. And a P1000 pipettes between 100 and 1000 microliters. A pipette is an expensive precision instrument. Improper use will damage the pipette, so correct use is essential. You should never use a pipette to measure volumes outside of its range. For example, using a P200 to pipette to lower volumes, such as 10 microliters, or to higher volumes, such as 250 microliters, will result in inaccurate volume measurements and will damage the internal mechanism of the pipette. Each pipette has a vertical row of three numbers visible in the body of the instrument. To set the volume, you can use either the thumb wheel or, on newer models, the push button. This will cause the three number dials in the body of the pipette to rotate and change the volume of liquid that will be taken up. However, the dial numbers indicate different volumes depending on which pipette is used. For example, these three pipettes have been set to read the same numbers on the dial, 1, 5, 2. For the P2, this means that the pipette is set to a volume of 1.52 microliters. The bottom two dials are in red, indicating 5 tenths and 2 hundredths of a microliter. For the P20, this means that the pipette is set to a volume of 15.2 microliters. The red bottom dial shows 2 tenths of a microliter. With the P200, the same visual setting means that the pipette is set to a volume of 152 microliters. This P1000 is set to 052, which indicates a volume of 520 microliters. A setting of 100 indicates the maximum volume for this pipette, which is 1000 microliters. The uppermost number is in red, which for this pipette indicates the number of milliliters. Once you've set the volume you need, attach the appropriate pipette tip to the end of the pipette. P20 and P200 pipettes use the same yellow tips. P1000 pipettes use larger blue tips. Another type of tip called a filter tip is often used in the laboratory. The sterile filter within each tip can help to prevent contamination. Hold the pipette with one hand with the narrow side resting in the palm of the hand. Add the pipette tip by gently but firmly pushing the pipette into the pipette tip which is held in a tip box. You may need a little practice to learn to apply the right amount of pressure to give a good airtight seal between the tip and the pipette. Liquid is drawn in and expelled using the pipette's push button. Gently apply pressure to the button with your thumb until you feel a natural stop. This is called the first stop. The distance you need to push the push button down will vary depending on the volume you require. 
A P20 set to 2 microliters will require less push button movement than a P20 set to 20 microliters. So to use the pipette, push the button down to the first stop. Then keeping the push button at this level, place the pipette tip about 2 millimeters into the liquid you wish to draw up. Release the push button by slowly allowing it to return to its original position. Pause for a second to make sure all the required volume of liquid has been taken up into the tip. This is especially important when using more viscous liquids which take longer to draw up. Withdraw the pipette tip from the liquid and place it inside the recipient container. Slowly push down on the push button. This will release the liquid in the pipette tip into the tube. This time push beyond the first stop. This ensures that any residual liquid is expelled from the pipette tip. Fully withdraw the pipette tip from the liquid before you release the push button. So to recap, push down the push button until you feel some resistance. Place the pipette into the liquid and slowly release the push button. Release the liquid from the pipette by pushing past the first stop to fully expel the liquid from the pipette tip into the recipient container. Withdraw the pipette from the container before you release the button. For very small volumes, the aspirated liquid can hang in a drop from the end of the tip and may not be transferred to the tube at all. So you should touch the tip to the inside wall of the recipient container whilst expelling the liquid. Once you've aspirated the liquid, release the pipette tip from the pipette by pressing down on the tip ejector. This is the small white button at the top of the main body of the pipette. Be sure that the attached pipette tip is inside the appropriate waste container before pressing the tip ejector. A new clean pipette tip should be used with each new liquid, or if the tip touches any surface or any liquid other than the one you're pipetting. If in doubt, change the tip. Do not use a pipette without a tip attached. Liquid should never enter the body of the pipette. It will cause the pipette to corrode and will be a major source of contamination between liquids and experiments. Do not use a pipette past its volume limits. This causes pipetting inaccuracies and also damages the pipette. If you're having trouble attaching a tip to your pipette, don't repeatedly jam the pipette into a tip. This can damage the pipette. And if the tip doesn't stay on the end of the pipette, simply repeat the procedure with a new tip. When pushing down the push button to take up a set volume of liquid, don't push past the first stop. If you push past the first stop, the volume you then take up will be too large. When taking up liquids, don't simply let go of the push button. The liquid can be sprayed around the inside walls of the tip and up into the pipette body causing inaccurate volume dispensing and pipette contamination. Make sure you release the push button in a controlled manner. If you don't pause after you release the push button, there won't be enough time for the correct volume to be taken into the tip. Air will be taken in instead. Also, when you're withdrawing a large volume from a narrow container, make sure the tip stays below the surface. Whenever you have liquid in a pipette tip, don't lay the pipette down. Liquid can get into the body of the pipette, which causes cross-contamination, pipette damage and inaccurate pipetting. And finally, remember when pipetting small volumes, touch the pipette tip to the side of the tube to ensure the liquid is released into the recipient container.